All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeline CRM, coming to you as usual from San Diego, blue sky as usual. Today I'm joined by Monica Parikh, who is in New York City. Hopefully there's some blue skies there too. We're having the most California weather we've ever had. No humidity and 76 degrees in August. Wow. Well, then it looks like you sent us your weather because the last couple of days we've been having humidity and that's against the law here. So I don't know who's <laughs> responsible for that. <laughs> well, my hair thanks you for sending your weather here then. <laughs> yeah. And Monica runs a School of Love NYC, which teaches women and men emotional intelligence so they can nurture their most important relationship for life. And what we're going to talk about today is, okay, relationships in this continuing COVID-19 era, how we can use today's challenges to move a global community to the next level of consciousness. So let me start by asking you, Monica, I guess there's a lot of people right now, they're probably not really thinking of levels of consciousness right now. They're thinking more of like, ah, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. How do I just survive this? Well, I mean, I think you're right. Sometimes we just have to throw the jargon in the trash. So when I think about consciousness, really what mm. I'm thinking about primarily is mental and emotional health. You know, mm -hmm. how do we basically achieve happiness and calm um, that is not dependent on outside circumstances? And how can we achieve emotional equilibrium on a day-to-day -day basis? Because really, like, what ends up happening is we transfer our feelings and emotions to other people. And when we don't even understand our own feeling states, we're just basically moving our bad energy everywhere. And you can yeah. see that in the media. You can see that in politics. You can see that just on a day-to-day -day level in your own family's home. Well, yes, especially when you see people trying to tear other people down and you realize that it, it, when you take a step back, it's hard when you're on the receiving end, but if you take a step back, you realize it's got more to do with them than it has ever to do with you. Oh, 100%. But, you know, also, I think that a big part of the shift is learning boundaries. And part of mm -hmm. boundaries is actually really taking care of your emotional health. So that when people are acting in such a, you know, aggressive, negative, toxic fashion, that you have the ability to basically say no or move away from those situations. And, you know, unfortunately, they're becoming more and more normative, especially like in the American workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and here's an interesting thing. I mean, you mentioned like, you know, mental health. And I think people, I think there's still a huge stigma around mental health and people still see mental health in such a narrow, they think, oh, mental health means you're over here and, you know, you're depressed, everything. But me mental health runs a huge spectrum and, and everybody has to pay attention to their mental health, particularly at times like this. I agree wholeheartedly. And you know, a big part of my business was basically to destigmatize mental health and emotional health care. Mm -hmm. I personally have been a client of psychotherapy and have worked with coaches my entire adult life. And I've seen that as almost like going to the gym, um, but it's going to the gym from my mind. So right. I was never ashamed to go to the gym five days a week. And I'm certainly not ashamed to deal with my emotions and understand my own emotional patterns better so that I can live more happily and freely and not feel anxiety and not feel depression. And, you know, as I head into the second half of my life to be filled with so much purpose and vitality and meaning, I think that's the goal that everybody should be striving for. Yeah, and, and I think that's so, it, it's so important because I think especially now, I mean, there's obviously everybody's been inf affected, I was going to say infected, thankfully everybody hasn't been infected, but everybody's been affected to some degree or another by the, the situation we're in. So it has had a mental and emotional impact on everybody, but I think I, I think a lot of people haven't stopped for a moment to think about what it, what has that impact been? How has it affected me? How am I affecting other people? I agree with you 100%. You know, last night I taught a class for two hours and for two hours, people were having a real dialogue about the financial distress that so mm. many people are being put under, the emotional distress, you know, working from home and perhaps living with your spouse or your partner and your children 24 seven, the onus of having to educate your children while also 
you know, doing the daily domestic tasks and also working, or perhaps, you know, you're quarantined alone like me, and you're dealing with the fallout of really like being isolated from other people. And the thing is, as much as we're dealing with the physical, you know, contagion, no one is talking about the emotional impact, especially like the things that we would normally do to deal with emotional, um, to like rid ourselves of stress, working out, you know, mm. being in communities of people and talking. These things have now been removed. The gyms are closed. Self-care, like, you know, massage, um, acupuncture, mm. hair salons have been closed. Then you're dealing with like great financial hardship. And I have not heard yet one single politician actually quantify the numbers of deaths that could happen from large scale mental illness that mm -hmm. could be set off by the remedies that we're actually like putting into place. Yeah, I, I spoke to somebody uh, from Melbourne, Australia the other day, and they are now, look, they said for the, um, particularly men ages 21 to 40, the suicide rates are far greater than than the COVID uh, deaths down there. And again, it's something that's not really been, been talked about. And I think the other part here is, as you're saying, yes, there's financial stress and everything. I think this, the uncertainty is people don't deal well with uncertainty. And now we have this collective uncertainty out there and um, so when you work with with people like how do you help them with dealing with that uncertainty realizing that uncertainty is always there really there's no there's you know nothing is for sure but now it seems like it seems particularly acute well i mean i think that there's a variety of tools the first one is just developing basically rituals you know, I'm a really big uh, proponent on rituals to ground yourself first thing in the morning, you know, um, exercise and meditation being my preferred tools as opposed to pharmaceuticals, which doctors are, you know, incentivized to prescribe. Sure. And then second, you know, you have to see how all of the um, different environmental factors could impact your mental health. Everything from processed food which is cooked in chemical labs to basically, you know, oftentimes those foods mimic the same um, feelings of anxiety or depression. Um, so the things that you eat and what you consume technology wise, you know, we're heading into the largest loneliness epidemic that has ever existed in the history of mankind at the same time that social media is becoming the preferred mechanism for connection. So are we connected or are we becoming more and more disparate? You know, to your mm -hmm. point about suicide, the number one cause of death for women right now is domestic violence, yeah. which says to me that a lot of these relationships were never built on solid foundations of you know, financial equity, or perhaps these people don't even understand how to communicate at a level where they can actually ask for boundaries, you know, space from one another or time away without it becoming personalized and, and escalating into like a more, you know, um, toxic altercation. Yeah. yeah I, and I think that it, it is so sad. And you think about maybe that, you know, life before when people are running around so busy they can somewhat paper over the cracks in these things but when they're suddenly you know isolated together and confronted with issues that they don't know how to deal with i think that's a i think that's a that's a huge issue and to your point about social media i totally agree with you i think we're the most con disconnected connected generation ever and i really feel for the younger people coming up through this because it's such a it, it has turned into such an insidious world online and people piling on i hear even with i hear through my son about people like online who you know say one wrong thing and then people just come out of everywhere to just destroy them and it's easy to do because you're sitting behind a device uh and it's and and somehow we're going to have to help people understand like the consequences of their actions and, and also the fact that you need to look at yourself first. You need to look at yourself first before you start doing anything else. Well, you know, the, the hard part about any sort of personal transformation work is that when you look at society, 50% of society would be considered self-analytical. 
So mm -hmm. they think whatever problem I have, I somehow must have created this problem and I have to right. figure out what is either in my thinking or behavior that has brought this upon me. But 50% of the population thinks you're the problem. And mm -hmm. so that 50% of the population is never going to be self-analytical. And so, you know, a lot of times what I talk to my clients about is many of the people who come to me, they are very outwardly empathetic meaning they have more empathy for other people than perhaps themselves. And as a result of that, they go into relationships where they're fixers. You know, yeah. maybe they're with somebody who has an addiction problem or an anger management problem or an anxiety or depression problem that isn't being treated. And they kind of are like, well, I can fix, I can love this mm -hmm. away. And, <laughs> you know, you have to kind of, I think, wake people up to the truth that, Time and energy is the most valuable commodity. And when you're dumping it into a, a wasteland <laughs> where this person is not going to take any responsibility for themselves or their own actions, then you're basically kind of almost flushing two lives down the toilet. And, you know, to break that codependency mm -hmm. and to just even have that conversation, because it's not a conversation that's normative or you know, anybody's even having in society. These are the, the things that go on behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great point. I mean, unfortunately, I don't think people are taught when they're growing up, taught that, the, that they deserve, you know, they deserve equality, you know, they deserve um, a, a mutual respect, you know, they deserve, you know, it's when it, particularly when it comes to relationships, and this isn't even a male-female thing, you know, you can just as easily have men who go into codependent relationships or whatever, but, but that they're not taught about the, you know, that the fundamentals of a relationship is, is two people, you know, two hopefully well-balanced people sharing something equally because they want it. Well, you know, the reason I started my business and I called it School of Love NYC was because I had an Ivy League education. And when I went through a divorce 11 years ago and I started going under the psychotherapeutic analytic process, wow. and also because I'm very nerdy, I started studying relationship psychology just feverishly. At some point, what I realized was, oh my God, you need all these skills to prosper in relationships, and our curriculum is woefully inadequate <laughs> at teaching any of them. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, you know, like when they've done longitudinal studies of the number one factor of human happiness, it's relationships. So mm -hmm. like the most important factor for us to be successful in life, we've been given no foundation or no structure in how to actually learn about it. And we put no time or energy in it. You know, I'm always, I had a conversation last week, a friend of mine who's a venture capitalist in Chicago, who, you know, has probably about $300,000 in diplomas you know, on his wall. And mm -hmm. then post that has entered into different, career um, accolades that have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars more. He and his wife now are having huge marital problems that are basically, you know, the, the foundation of the relationship is crumbling. And I asked him, you know, how much money have you and your wife actually spent on any sort of personal development work? And the answer was none. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, it's a little bit like having a car that you never take up for a tune-up ever. And then you come to somebody at year 15 and you're like, you know, it's leaking oil. The engine is like shot. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you have to start to look at these very important assets in your life and say like, and humble yourself enough to say it's just a different kind of education, but it's a very important one for me to actually spend mm. money on and take seriously. Yeah. yeah, and it takes and it takes work. I mean, I think that's the other thing, unfortunately, that we live in this shortcut, easy culture where everything is supposed to be dead easy, right? You know, you're not supposed to have to make an effort for anything. It's just, and I think, unfortunately, people go into relationships um, with that same attitude, thinking that it's always going to be like it was in the first, you know, whatever they call it, the first glow, um, that piece, that it's not, you've got two people and two people have to figure out, you've got more people, I don't know, whatever you choose. Um, <laughs> um, but, but that they're, 
but that it's going to take some work. And I think that's the part that I think to your point is like investment in education and then just in, in realizing that it does take work to create happiness. I agree with you 100%. And I think, you know, I, I think the thing that's really empowering or the opportunity that exists is the more work that I did on myself, mm -hmm. it was like my entire life was changing. You know, like the anxiety I had suffered from, the panic attacks I had suffered from were gone. I never have them anymore. You know, any of sort of that self critical voice in my head was silenced me finding my life purpose and the thing that enervates me and put so much energy in my life that was worth so much more than my legal degree was, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that when you realize that there's huge returns on that work, you know, probably much greater returns than you get from 9 million other ways you use your time and energy in life, mm -hmm. you know, but it's a process and it takes time and you have to find the right guide who doesn't stigmatize it, that makes it feel mm -hmm. like it's an enjoyable, pleasant experience, which is what I really try to do for my own clients. Yeah. And I think that's a, I think that's a really good point because I think now is the time, let's face it, if, if, if anything COVID has done, it's certainly given people a lot more sort of spare time, shall we say, maybe they didn't want it, but they got it regardless. Yeah. And so it has, it is a great time to start exploring some of these things. And particularly, I mean, if you're in a lockdown situation and maybe you are a little, you know, there's a little friction, shall we say, in the, in your in your domestic situation you know maybe that's the time the universe is telling you here you've got the time where i'm laying bare the issues here now is your time to actually go and confront them and do do a little bit of work and invest in yourself well you know i think that most people myself included don't actually go into any sort of personal transformation work unless they've hit a pretty decent pain <laughs> point Pain has a wonderful way of being a catalyst to kind of change the way we think about a problem. And, you know, some like with my venture capitalist friend I was telling you about, right. one of the things I said to him was calm down, like mm -hmm. understand that, yes, there is a problem, but you don't have to freak out. You kind of just have to understand how to begin to calm yourself down and understand that problems are natural. Conflict is natural. And just because the relationship is has hit a, a crisis point which is very very normal mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that on the other side of that crisis point won't be more love more intimacy more yeah. connectivity especially as you kind of start to clear out the gunk that's been making this vehicle a little less efficient <laughs> than we would like and so honestly i think that the greatest thing that could happen is that we could destigmatize a lot of the psychotherapeutic conversations that happen behind closed doors and we could kind of get honest and have somebody who's just in an optimistic and uplifting way say yes we are all at a moment of great pain now let's all collectively calm ourselves down so we can begin to see the opportunities that exist at this moment in time yeah, no, I, I love that because I, I, I think you're, you're so right there and the, because the natural tendency is to, is to entrench and to put up the barriers and just throw up your hands and say, oh, this isn't, this isn't going to work. It's reached that point. But, he, but what you were saying is, no, it, it's reached a point where, yes, something or some things need to change, need to evolve. So you can look at it as an opportunity or you can look at it, uh, you know, you can just retrench and off you go. Um, and I think that's the other part is about what we were saying about the mental health stigma is I do think hopefully coming out of this is that people do realize there is a mental health you know, spectrum. And to be honest, this practice, there is nobody in the world who doesn't need to pay attention to their mental health, whether it's, whether it's, it's a, on a small scale or whether it's on a large scale, it's there. And it's something like if you want to take care of your physical health, you've got to take care of your mental and emotional health, too. You know, if I was president of the United States, I would, well, first I would fix the, I would try to fix the issue with healthcare in this country. We'll, we'll put that to the side. But second, I would make mental health um, education mandatory mm. for everybody. You know, I don't think there's, nobody feels a stigma when they say, oh, I went running in the park this morning. 
And yeah. no one should feel a stigma for saying, you know what, there's somebody that I talk to and they help me think about problems in a different way. And it, and it leads to me being a happier parent, a better worker, a better spouse. And, mm -hmm. you know, I personally think that it, it's such a beneficial thing. And I'm sad that more people aren't speaking about it publicly and saying, yeah, I engage in it and it's been awesome. It's been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, it's an independent person who has no emotional or familial or whatever connections to you. Somebody that you can talk to who can look at things dispassionately and from an, from an independent point of view. And as you say, encourage and help. I mean, it's like, it's who it's almost like a perfect friend because there's no give back right you don't have to listen to their problems <laughs> oh, exactly it actually is a perfect friend you know it's funny because like the thing that i often will say to my clients there's something in psychology that's called repetition compulsion mm -hmm. which is basically we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again until we develop an awareness that that's not the right pattern of behavior. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the thing is, is that, you know, in our families, we, and this is even in the best families possible, we get taught things that are wrong because most yeah. parents don't go to psychology school of this is the proper way to parent, or this is how you can regulate your own emotions, or this is what a boundary and a consequence is. And you know, all of this lingo is new, you know? And so what I always say to my clients is, okay, well, you know, you can end this relationship and swipe left or swipe right mm -hmm. and start all over again. But more than likely, you're just going to draw the exact same person <laughs> right to you in a different body. And at some point, you're just going to realize this is a gross waste of time and energy. <laughs> Maybe the better thing to do is to take the harder path, you know, like, and yeah. harder meaning to me, it's a little bit like, a fad diet versus I'm going to go to the gym and like mm -hmm. stop eating all this junk. Like these are two pathways. And so you're just trying to figure out how to be efficient in your pathway, basically, yeah. you know? And, and I think that's, I think that's a, that's a great way of putting it uh, because I do think, yeah, I think everybody wants a quick fix and, you know, often there isn't, there isn't that quick fix there, but also to your point, I think sometimes when, especially when people look back at, you know, their, their parents or whatever, sometimes you have to say, yeah, you know, yeah, they made a lot of mistakes, but they were operating with the best tools that they had, which maybe they weren't very good tools, but that's all they had, right? They didn't, 100%. to your point, they were never educated. They, they, nobody gave them any other tools. I mean, I think the thing that you have to do though, is you have to honor the feelings of people who often are exceptionally rageful or sad at the, poor ways that their parents parented them. Sure, you know, sure, like sure. Mm -hmm. I teach a lot about forgiveness, which I think, um, you know, there's something in relationship psychology that's to me very fascinating, which is basically our subconscious, not our conscious mind. Our subconscious mind is always seeking out our parental figures. And mm -hmm. it's done by design to basically create the exact same pain that we experienced as a child, again, in adulthood, which means that the crisis that we experience in relationships was designed in a, in a Darwinian evolutionary biology way to wake us up and say, ah, that's not the way to do things. I have to change and basically mm -hmm. evolve and move forward. But until you understand all that, and until you actually even understand your childhood and your parents and that relationship and actually heal that woundedness, it's nearly impossible to have a successful love relationship. Mm. And, you know, you have to have somebody who's very gentle guiding you through that process because sometimes it can feel like sticking your finger in an electric socket. Like it, it causes so much psychological pain to consider my parents didn't love me in a healthy way. And, right. you know, you have to have somebody who's able to kind of like calm the parasympathetic nervous system down and really like speak to you in a way that you can hear and guide you through that process. But on the other side of that, you can have, you know, much more fulfilling relationships with your family members because mm -hmm it's not so confrontive anymore. Like you can right. kind of see it all without being so emotionally attached to it. This, the sad thing that happens is once you kind of 
realize the dysfunction of your family, then it kind of also wakes you up to the dysfunction of all of society. <laughs> so it like yeah, is a doorway to a lot of other alone. things. <laughs> it's always good to know that you're not alone. It's not exclusive to you. And right, I think, exactly. Uh, it wasn't you, it was all of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, this is Monica, this has been fantastic. It's a great note to end on. Yeah, hey, the whole of society's messed up. What can we say? <laughs> No, but I, I really would, I really would on a more serious note, I really would encourage people that even if you think that you have weathered this storm really, really well, I would still encourage you to take a moment out to think about how has it really impacted you because it has had an impact on you, whether you recognize it now or not. And things like what Monica does with this school of love, um, please check that out as well, because I do think it's important for us to invest in ourselves so that we can give the best of ourselves to other people, right? to our families, to our kids, to society in general. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Yeah, it was fantastic. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. Uh, all of Monica's information will be in her contributor bio below here. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about the School of Love and what you do. Yeah, so I basically have built a curriculum. It goes for about nine months. It's confidential and anonymous. And I have people from around the world basically learning the skills of emotional intelligence. So, you know, my most popular classes are boundaries. So how to mm -hmm. like speak and speak your truth and know what your feelings and needs are. And basically um, my curriculum is based on nonviolent communication, which is you know, the, the de-escalation of conflict and basically understanding and developing an awareness of your own emotional state so you can feel happier for longer periods of time. Yeah, that's fantastic. And clearly, clearly there's a lot of people who could do with that nonviolent <laughs> communication lesson right now. So again, my name is John Golden. Thanks everybody for joining us and thanks Monica. This has been a blast. Thank you. Thank you.